so. But tonight we're in chapter 3 here, verses 15 through 22 of Galatians. So let's begin reading. I'll read verses 15 through 18, and we'll get into our study. And what we're looking at is, uh, why the law? Why did God give the law of Moses? And, and frankly, to be honest with you, even before I begin the study, there are so many reasons. I mean, there are, you could probably number 10 to 15 specific reasons for the law. I'm not going to give you all 15 of those tonight, but I will be uh, uh, touching on that subject a bit as we look at this particular portion of Scripture. Galatians chapter 3, verses 15 through 18. Paul writes, Brethren, I speak in the manner of men. Though it is only a man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Now, to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. And this I say, that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Now, I want to begin by actually going over verses 13 and 14 again, because I need to get a running start to verse 15. And so, Last time we were together, we closed with those verses. In verses 13 and 14 of this chapter, it says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And so notice as we begin how, how Paul had said that Christ redeemed us, notice, from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. When he says Christ has redeemed us, that word redeemed is a Greek word that means to buy someone out of, of uh, slavery. It speaks of buying a slave's freedom. The Bible makes it very clear, in other words, that prior to coming to Christ, we were slaves. We were slaves to sin. But the Lord Jesus Christ has redeemed us. He's purchased us. He's, he's bought us out. He's bought our freedom, and he did so uh, through his blood. You see, redemption is, is Jesus... Uh, buying us out of slavery at a cost. And, and the price was the blood of Jesus Christ. When Paul was writing to the Ephesians in chapter 1, verse 7, that's what he says. He says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. And so when Paul is speaking concerning the fact that we've been redeemed, he is first and foremost pointing out that, that it was an act of mercy on the part of God uh, and it was a gracious act for him to actually send his son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross in order that he would pour out his blood, that he might be able to redeem us out of slavery, that we would have the freedom that comes through knowing God through Jesus Christ. You see, he speaks concerning this curse. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. And so when he speaks of the curse of the law, what is that curse of the law? Well, the curse of the law is the punishment that is demanded for failing to keep the law in its entirety. It's the punishment that occurs because I failed to keep the law, because I, I haven't lived, in other words, a perfect life. The Bible in Leviticus chapter 18, verse 5 says, You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. And so I was intended, or it would be intended for me if I were to enter into the kingdom of heaven through simple obedience to a law, well, it would be required of me to keep the entire law because the law demands complete obedience. The problem is, is my inability to keep the law causes me to actually become guilty because I failed. You have the law, the commandments. We normally look at those commandments as the Ten Commandments, the commandments that you find in various places in the Old Testament, repeated throughout the New. And so we have a tendency of thinking, well, there were only Ten Commandments, and we could probably keep them. Of course, we couldn't keep them. But we need to remember that there were not only the Ten Commandments specifically given to us in Exodus, but there are also 
altogether some 613 commandments. And so there's no way that anybody's going to keep all 613 commands. And when we break one, we have in effect actually violated them all. And so if we're guilty in one, we're guilty of them all. And therefore, the bottom line is, is nobody is perfect. Only Jesus was. And so that's why God sent his son. God sent his son to perfectly fulfill the requirements of his law. That's what it means in verse 13 when it says, having become a curse for us. In other words, Jesus took our punishment that was really just on himself. Now, what was that punishment? Well, the punishment is is death. Like Paul says in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. So when the Lord Jesus Christ came and fulfilled all the requirements of his Father, he also died as a substitution for me. He kept the law perfectly where I can't, and he actually paid my price, which was death, when he died on that cross. And that's what Paul is speaking about. You see, it says there, it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. He got that out of the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 21, 23. You see, during that time when a criminal would be executed, they were normally executed through being stoned. And they would be tied to a post, and then they would hang until sunset as an open expression of rejection by God. Now, the Romans would actually take living prisoners and nail them to a cross. They also would actually nail them to trees. I have a picture that we have that we, we uh, took while we were in Israel on one of our trips of a tree, and uh, it actually has a cross beam that has been nailed to it because they didn't always cut the trees down. Often they would find a small enough tree to use and they would just put a cross beam on that. And sometimes the tree actually had branches that would branch out in such a way that they would actually use the branches. And so what the Romans would do, unlike the Jews, the Jews would normally stone the prisoner or the, the, the person who's being punished, who is receiving capital punishment. They would stone him, he would die by stoning and then they would place him on a tree so that people would see it and that would be a demonstration of God's uh, displeasure towards that particular sin and all. It was a, some kind of lesson that the people would get. But the Romans would actually take living individuals, place them on those crosses or those trees, and would do so in order to demonstrate their own justice. Well, Jesus died on a cross. And when Jesus died on that cross, he became that atoning sacrifice for us. And that's why he said, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. Jesus died on a cross, and he suffered our condemnation. Now, when he's speaking about that, he says that Jesus did that for us. But notice why, verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, when he speaks of the blessing of Abraham, all we need to do, and let me just touch this lightly, is remember Abraham. Abraham is the father of the Jewish nations. And God, in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, had called him and said, I'm going to take you to a land that I'm going to give to you, and I'm going to bless you. Later on, when he was speaking to him in Genesis 17, let me read it to you. It says it in Genesis 17, 1 through 6. God said, when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I'm the Almighty God. Walk before me and be perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Abraham fell on his face. And God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. Neither shall your name any more be called Abram. Your name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made you, and I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come out of you. Abram literally means high father, exalted father. Abraham means father of many nations. He's saying, I'm going to take you, change your name, and I'm going to bless you, and you are going to be the one that I use to bless the world. So this blessing, this blessing of Abraham, what is that referring to? It refers to salvation, how God is going to bless people who have the faith of Abraham. Abraham had faith in God. He trusted God. He believed God. God counted it as righteousness. So salvation's blessings and benefits are to extend to all who have faith like Abraham. 
Now those who have faith in Jesus Christ would be called children of Abraham. He had already made that clear. Look at verses 7 through 9 in this chapter. Notice and remember again how and it says, Therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the nations by faith preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Remember the context. There are people who are entering into the churches of Galatia and are bringing with them a foreign doctrine. They are coming in saying that in order for you to have a relationship with God, you need to find yourself under the yoke of the law. And what they're doing is they're trying to bring the spirit of legalism into the church. And so Paul has been dealing with that. He calls that a foreign message. It's not the gospel. And he's trying to make a case for the Galatians to understand that Abraham, before he had received uh, the rite of circumcision, had already been called blessed by God. So it wasn't through the act of circumcision, an act or a work of faith, but rather the receiving of faith that had caused him to have a right standing with God, to be blessed by God, and to be called by God righteous. But the problem we're having is that these individuals are entering in, they're bringing a foreign doctrine and causing people to no longer understand the joy that comes through the grace of God and the freedoms that come through a relationship with Him through Jesus Christ and the power that comes through Him when you open your heart up and receive the power of the Spirit of God to change your life and to gift you and produce the fruit of the Spirit. And what happens is you get caught up with legalism. You get into the do's and the don'ts, the I can do this and I can't do that kind of mentality to the point that it quenches the Holy Spirit. And before you know it, you're constantly worried about whether you've been good enough for God today. And there are an awful lot of people who live under that kind of bondage. And, and that's not, not something new. That was something that was entering into the church very early. And so he wants to make it clear, listen, the curse is lifted by our place in faith in Jesus Christ. We join in the family of Abraham, the family of the redeemed through faith in Jesus. That's what he's saying. Notice again, verse 14, we receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. We receive the Holy Spirit, not by trying to be good, not by becoming extra religious, but we receive the promise of the Spirit by simple faith, asking God. And the interesting and beautiful thing about that is, is what we do is we say, God, be merciful unto me. I need you. Lord, I want you in my life. Would you come in? And by faith, the Lord enters in. You become the temple of the Spirit of God. And this is the promise that God gave to you. In the book of Acts, if you take notes, it's found in chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Luke writes, being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which says he, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days from now. Receive the promise of the Father. It's a promise that God gives to you. When on one occasion, the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking to his people and he says, you need to become like little children. And there's one thing that all of us who have been around little children or who have our own little children, or if they've been little children, or even as they're adults, they still act like little children. There's one thing I know about little children. They don't forget a promise that's being made. They don't forget. They can forget all kinds of things. They can forget to, uh, to brush their teeth. They can forget to comb their hair. They can forget they're supposed to take a bath. They can forget to clean their room. They can forget to go out and, my dad used to call it, massage the lawn, mow the lawn. They can forget to do all kinds of things, but it's a funny thing that they don't forget a promise made to them. They remember those promises, and they'll hold you to them, and they'll say it the same way. All kids, I think it's a universal thing. I don't think it even matters what language it's said in, but it's always the same thing. You said, you said, and oh, what did I say? You said if, and, and they remember your promises. They do remember your promises, and they believe you're going to come through on those promises, by the way. They believe that you're good to your word, and if you said you're going to take them to Disneyland, they will remind you for 364 days that you said, you said that, and they believe that you're good for your word. I remember my mom when I was about six or seven years old. Disneyland, I think, opened up in 54 or 55, right around in that time. And... Uh, you know, I grew up in Norwalk, so Disneyland in Anaheim was only a 15-minute drive away. 
And oh, I remember my brother and I wanted to go to Disneyland. And so my mom had said, I've got a surprise for you. I've got a surprise for you. And so naturally, we didn't know exactly what the surprise was, but we were hoping it would be something great. Well, the fact is, they were going to take us to Disneyland. And they put us in that car that the problem is it was raining. I still remember it was raining. Now, my mom has been saying, I've got a promise for you, and you're going to really be surprised. I didn't know what it was. It turns out it was to go to Disneyland, but we couldn't go to Disneyland because it was raining. So rather than that, my mom, even though she gave us a, you know, a promise for a surprise, didn't know exactly what to do, so she didn't tell us the surprise was off. So my brother Frank and I are sitting in the back seat of my dad's car, and off we're going, and instead of going towards what you know, would have been Disneyland, we went off towards Santa Monica. And as we we're going to go visit my aunt, I can still remember we pulled into this hamburger stand just outside of where my aunt lived, and it started to snow. And it doesn't snow in California. You know that, not around here anyway. And my brother and I were so thankful to my dad because he made it snow. We, we, oh, dad, oh, you're too much. What a great dad we have. You know, when you, when you get, well, after, I, I've told you before, my dad was Superman. He taught me that he was Superman. I believed he was Superman because my hero in life was Superman. I used to watch Superman on TV. They had a program every week, Superman. My dad actually got jealous that I really, really wanted, you know, I loved Superman, so my dad told me he was Superman. And so I grew up really believing my dad was Superman, even though I, you know, I would see the, car the cartoon character or the, the guy who played him on TV, I think his name was George Reeves, and he didn't look anything like my dad. And, and I knew that Superman, well, Superman was clean shaven. My dad had this little pencil mustache, and I used to wonder how he got it off to do the adventures and then put it back on later on. I really never figured that one out. But I knew my dad was Superman until one day as I got older, I've shared this with you before, I, I finally walked up to my dad and said, uh, Dad, I really don't think you're Superman. And my dad said uh, to me, uh, yes, I am. I said, where's your uniform? Where's your uniform? He says, I have it up in the garage. I have it hidden in the garage. And so he went to work, and I went into the garage. And I climbed on the rafters. I climbed over everything. I even went outside, climbed on a fence, jumped on top of the roof, and looked in all kinds of hedges and things that were up there on the top of the roof. And when my dad got home, I was waiting for him. And he comes rolling up, and I walked up to him, and I said, you're not Superman. And he says, what do you mean? I said, I looked for your, your uniform today. I couldn't find it. I went into the garage. I climbed up on top. I looked in all the shelves. I even got on top of the roof. You are not Superman. And he looks at me, and he shakes his head and folds his arms, and he says, my, my, my uniform's at the cleaners. <laughs> and I said, duh, I should have known that one, you know? And I mean, I was 32 years old and <laughs> when he said that. But you know your father can do whatever your father says he's going to do. That's why it's important that, that we who are fathers, that's why we keep our promises. We ought to keep our promises. We teach them that we're good to our word. Well, my God is good to his word, and he gave a promise. And the promise that he gave was not based on how hard I tried. The promise he gave is related to what he was going to do for me. It's his goodness, his mercy, his compassion, his grace. And so I received that promise that was given to me, the promise of the Father, which is the promise of the Holy Spirit, and that's what he's speaking about, the promise of the Spirit, and it comes through faith. Now, as he's speaking about this, moving on in verse 15, he says, Brethren, I speak in the manner of men, though it is only a man's covenant, yet it is confirmed. No one annuls or adds to it. So Paul now begins to show the superiority of faith in God's promise over the law. And, and, and when he says, I speak in the manner of men, he's simply saying, I'm going to use a common example. And the example I'm going to use that you're all familiar with is contracts. He says, men draw up contracts that are binding. If you go and you sign your name on a contract, it is binding. He's just using something they're familiar with. And he's simply saying, God's promises are binding. You see, when God draws up a contract, it's as solid as God himself is. When he makes a promise, you can trust him. His word is good. In Hebrews 6, 13 and 14, it says, When God made a promise to Abraham because he could not swear by anyone greater, he swore by himself, 
saying, surely I will bless you, and multiplying, I will bless you. So he's saying, even when a man makes a contract, that man holds fast to the contract that has been drawn up. So he goes on in verse 16 to say, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed. And then he identifies who this seed is, and that seed is Jesus Christ. Every single promise that has been given in the covenant, in that agreement with Abraham, every single promise was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. In Genesis 22, 18, God said, In your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And so the promises that God gave to Abraham are fulfilled in Jesus. That's why in 2 Corinthians 1, 20, that's why Paul would say all the promises of God in him are yes and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Now, interestingly, notice verse 17, and this I say, that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. Now, this is going to take just a bit to share with you because as you look at this, and I want you to see this with me, notice how he says the law, which was 430 years later. Well, First, he's saying the promise of God is superior, is superior because it was first given. It actually was given, though he uses the number 430 years, it was actually given some 645 years before Moses received the law. The 430 years refers to the time elapsed between God's last statement of the Abrahamic covenant and his giving of the law to Moses. Because we know that God gave his promise to, to Abraham, but when you read your Old Testament, you see that he repeated the promise to Isaac in chapter 26, verse 24 of Genesis. And then he repeated the promise once again to his grandson Jacob, which occurs 215 years after Abraham had received the promise. And so the law came 430 years after God repeated the promise of Abraham to Jacob. Now, he says in verse 18, For if the inheritance is of the law, it's no longer a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. An inheritance based on promise depends on the power of God. God made a promise. In your seed shall all the nations be blessed. Let's remember our biblical history for just a moment. God appears, ministers to Abraham gives him his promise, in you all the nations shall be blessed. It's through your seed. Well, he's referring really to the Messiah. But at the same time, God is making a promise to him that he and Sarah are going to have a child. We know by just reading our Old Testament that God had made that promise, but Sarah remained barren. And at one point, Sarah, beginning to think that that promise was never going to be fulfilled, begins to think about how she can help God to fulfill the promise. And so she approaches her husband and says, go into my handmaiden, Hagar. She will bear a child. It'll be the child that God has promised us. And because she is my handmaiden, according to Jewish uh, custom, according to their custom, any child that is born to my handmaiden, Sarah could say, is really legally looked at as being my own. And so in essence, what she's saying is, I will be recognized as a mother, you will be the father, and that will be fulfilling God's promise. Well, we know that Abraham went into Hagar and they had a son by the name of Ishmael. But God didn't promise, and we're gonna see this later on in Galatians, God didn't promise through Ishmael. God made the promise between Abraham and his wife, Sarah. Now, later on, it's found in Genesis, starting in chapter 17, and you can move into chapter 19, and, and you can see this being fulfilled. But in, in, in chapter 17 of Genesis, it, it points out that, that Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was 90 when God said, your wife's going to have a baby. Now, ladies... 
How'd you like to be nursing when you're 91? To get up at 3 in the morning to change the baby's diaper and you're 91. I mean, think about it. Think about it for a moment. And Abraham, I'm 100 years old. Are you kidding me? The writer of Hebrews says that his body was as good as dead. There was really no regenerative power within him. But God gave to him the ability to do something. To actually, at, oh, it blows my mind, at the age of 100, to be a daddy. And Sarah, at 90, come oh, on, to be a mommy. Think about that for a minute when you take that baby to preschool. <laughs> Who's that very, very old lady? That's mommy. <laughs> I mean, think about it. <laughs> it's an amazing story. But God had made the promise. It was really not a human possibility for a 90-year-old woman to conceive and have a child. That's why God makes it so very clear that this is all a promise. This is all of God. The flesh could not have in any way, shape, or form fulfilled this. It isn't going to happen. So that gives to us the illustration of the fact that God can do what our flesh cannot do. God gives promises that only he can fulfill. You see, the promise is superior because man can't help but fail but God never can fail. Now, in verse 18, again, when it says, the inheritance is of the law, an inheritance normally is received and not earned, and an inheritance normally comes when somebody has died. The writer of Hebrews chapter 9, verses 16 and 17 says, in the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it, because a will is in force only when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. And so trying to earn the inheritance is foolish. The only way to receive it is to trust his promise. And that's the point he's making, to have faith. Well, in verse 19, well, what purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of the transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture has confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those, he says, who believe. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added, he says in verse 19, because of transgressions. If salvation has always been by faith, then why do we have the law? The law is a tool to demonstrate man's sinfulness. The law reveals the depth of a human's sin nature. The law has impossible demands. You know that. And its impossible demands were to compel men to see themselves as helpless sinners. The law was intended to drive people into despair over their sins. You know, sometimes when people get into that point of despair, we Christ Christians try to talk them out of it, when in reality, it's intended to, to point them to God. It's intended to awaken them and to say to them, you're in misery right now and, and you're not doing well right now and you, your conscience is, is, is just chewing you up right now because there's a reason for it to do that because what you've done ought to make you feel bad. It ought to make you feel bad that you lied to your mom. It ought to make you feel bad that you went and got drunk and smashed your car into somebody else's car. It ought to make you feel bad. It ought to make you feel bad that you went and stole something and got caught because stealing's wrong. Lying is wrong. Committing adultery is wrong. And it ought to cause you to say, God, help me. That's what the law is intended to do. It's intended to wake us up to the reality of the fact that there's something within us that's wrong with us. And no matter how many classes of self-esteem I take, 
I'm really, really something within me really is aware of the fact that I'm not as good as I try to make myself seem, even to myself. In Romans chapter 7, Paul said it this way in verse 7, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, You shall not covet. Now, I knew that I had this desire for the possessions of somebody else. I knew that that was part of me. I just thought it was just normal and natural. But now I realize that the law says thou shalt not covet to give me an idea of how bad that really is. And so the law was intended by God to be a schoolmaster that brings us to Christ. It was to awaken us to our own weaknesses and our own inabilities to live a life that has peace and joy. That's how you got saved, if you're saved. That's how you got saved. You got saved because one day, somehow, as the Word of God was brought to you, you awaken to the reality of an imperfect life. You awaken to the reality that you perhaps were hurtful or perhaps you were a thief or perhaps you were a violent individual or perhaps you were, you were in bondage to drugs and alcohol or maybe you were simply petty. I, it doesn't really matter what it was. Whatever it was, you became aware of it. Whatever it was, you became aware and you said to yourself, I hate this, I hate this about myself, I don't want to be like this, I can't stand what I do to other people and I can't stand how I feel about the way life is for me. I, I feel like there's no meaning, there's no purpose, there's nothing here. I don't know what's going on. The Holy Spirit speaks to you and says it's because you're in sin. And the Holy Spirit says to the Word, but I can deal with that. I can forgive you. I can give you a sense of inner peace that you cannot get any other way. Just before I got saved, just before I got saved. I was arrested. I spent the night in jail. That was the third time I'd been arrested. My dad went and picked me up. I was in LA County in Los Angeles. My dad came and picked me up. My dad drove me home in silence, so upset at me. I think I was about 19 years old. I was 19 years old. I can remember as we were driving, I turned and looked at my dad as he was silently driving. My dad didn't smoke, but he had a pack of cigarettes and he was chain smoking. He was so upset at me, one cigarette after another. My dad didn't smoke. I hadn't seen my dad smoke since I was a little boy. And there he was just chain smoking. And I turned to him. I still remember saying to my dad, I'm sick. And my dad looked at me. And there was no argument about that one. You know what he did? He sent me to a psychologist. And I started going to a psych. And I would sit there with a stranger. And I'm one of these real quiet guys anyway. If I don't know you, I'm not going to really talk much to you at that age. Then he'd say, well, how you doing or whatever. And and I'm supposed to spill my guts to somebody I don't know for an hour. And I'm just not good at that. And I remember just kind of sitting there looking at him, kind of making small talk, not really saying things. But I do remember saying something like, you know what, I really need a girlfriend is what I need. That's what I really believed I needed. I needed love. My problem was that I was looking for the wrong kind of love. I was looking for the love that a woman can give you. And it's just not enough. It isn't. A human being's love can only go so far. That's the truth. It only goes so far. God's love is inexhaustible. It goes beyond anything you can understand. It is incomprehensible. Its depth and its width and its height, its breadth is beyond anything that any human being can give you. I didn't need the love of a woman to save me. I needed the love of God to save me. And I didn't understand that. I knew there was, a, there was, a, there was something in me. It was like a, 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 a dark, dark kind of like an abscess in my soul. I knew there was something wrong but I didn't know what the answer was. 
So as was natural for a natural man, I started thinking, well, the answer is going to be a relationship with a woman. No. The answer was a relationship with God because there is a God-shaped hole in your heart that only God himself can fill. And I didn't understand that. I didn't realize that. The law wakes you up to your own weaknesses. It, it puts a label to the things that make you miserable and says, this is why you're miserable, because you haven't put me first, because you don't honor me, because you take my name in vain, because you steal, because you lie, because you covet, because of all these things in your life. These are the things that make you miserable. And the reason you do all of those things is because you don't know me. So the law has a purpose. It's to compel you to Jesus Christ who saves you. You see, he says in verse 19, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. In other words, Jesus fulfilled all the requirements of the law. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. In Romans 10, verse 4, Paul said, Christ is the end of the law. In other words, the law points to Christ for righteousness to everyone, he said, who believes. And so the purpose of the law was to bring us to Jesus Christ. Now notice in verse 19, it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Um, briefly, in a way that is not fully explained, angels somehow were involved in the giving of the law. In Acts 7.53, uh, we read, who have received the law by the disposition of angels. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 2, it says, if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just re recompense of reward. So somehow angels were involved, but it doesn't really say how. He says it was appointed through angels. But he says in verse, uh, verse 19, through angels by the hand of a mediator, verse 20, now a mediator doesn't mediate for one only, but God is one. In other words, God gave the covenant directly to Abraham without a mediator. So finally, he says in verse 21, is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture has confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. In summation, just in conclusion, a couple of things. One, the law could not save a sinner. Only Jesus can. That's why Paul would say, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Then he said, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. I've said, said this before because this book reminds me of so much of where I was at just before I got saved, and that's why I always go back to certain things. I can still remember just before I got saved, after going through so many crazy things, I can remember just before getting saved how I began to cry and say to God, cry out to God and say to God, you've got to help me. I can't take it anymore. I cannot stand who I am. I can't take it. I cannot take it. I cannot take this. I got drafted. I've shared this with you before. My birthday is August 23rd. I'm supposed to go into the military August 25th. I have a friend of mine whose birthday was uh, August 24th. So on August 24th, the day before I'm supposed to go into the military, we have a big party combining our birthdays and a lot of guys show up. And we spent the night drinking and smoking pot you know, just doing drugs and things. And I didn't go home. It was the 24th, and I didn't go home. I finally made my way to my house at about 2 o'clock in the morning. And I climbed into my car. I had my car parked on the side of my parents' house. And I had a, uh, a mattress in the back seat. And three friends and I got into the car 
at 2 in the morning and were smoking pot. And I could look at the window there on the side of my parents' house, and the light was on. And I would see my mom as she was looking out the window to see when her son was going to come home, because I was leaving the next morning at 6. And it's 3 o'clock in the morning. And I'm looking at my mom, and I turn to my friends, and I said, my mom's looking for me, and she doesn't even realize I'm in here. And I can still remember we lit up and continued smoking dope until a little after 3. The light goes off. I waited a few minutes. I went to the side door, opened it up, quietly went into my room, laid down on my bed, and tried to sleep for about three hours. I woke up. I went walking into the kitchen. My dad, my two sisters, and my mom were standing there in the kitchen when I walked in. My dad was really upset. My two sisters were crying. And so was my mom. And my mom looks at me and she says to me, you couldn't come home one night? Because I never was home. I was always partying. I was always drunk. I was always loaded. I never came home until they were asleep. That's just the way it was. And I looked at my mom and I said, what does it matter? I'll be gone from now on for another two years. You won't see me again. I won't cause you any more problems. And my dad shook his head and just looked at me. He put me in his little truck and drove me to Los Angeles to the induction center. He gave me $10. And I went into the induction center there. When I went in, I started speaking to one of the guys who process you. And he says, you have a felony count because when I was 18, I had burglarized a jewelry store. I knew that that count had been expunged. I knew that. He says, we can take you in and deal with it while you're in, or you can leave. What do you want to do? So I said, I want to get out of here. And my dad had given me $10, and there was one other guy named Gary, a high school friend of mine who I used to do a lot of drugs with, who was also rejected that day. So I make a phone call to a friend of mine named Rick, and he said, can you come to L.A., pick us up, Gary and I? And he said, yeah. Gary had a lid. He had a can. He had some pot. So we went out, and I took my friends to breakfast with my dad's $10, and we smoked pot, and I came home loaded. And when I walked in, because my dad was on vacation, when I walked into the house, my dad looks at me and says, what are you doing home? And I said, even the Army doesn't want me. And I started to laugh, and I went to my room, and I went to bed because I was so loaded from the night before that I had to sleep it off. That's the kind of person I was. My mom could cry, and I would tell her, you know what, just leave it, keep it to yourself. My, my, my sisters said, we're praying for you. And I said to them, keep your prayers for yourself. Religion is for the weak. It's, it's, it's a crutch for those who don't have strength to live for themselves. Keep it for yourself. Just, just leave me alone. I don't want to hear about your God. I don't want to hear about prayer. I don't want to hear about any of that. Just leave me alone. That's how I was. And so you could see that at a certain point, I started saying things like, God, I can't stand this anymore. I've got to change. I've got to change. I'm hurting too many people. I'm hurting my mom. I'm hurting my dad. I'm hurting my sisters. I hurt my brother. Every girlfriend I ever had, I've hurt. I can't take this anymore. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? That's what we all go through. But thanks be to God because of Jesus Christ. You see, the law confined us. When he speaks concerning that, concerning that in verse 22, the scripture has confined all under sin. It, it, it was like a cage that, that confined us. It, it, it enclosed us. In other words, all were found to be sinners and there was no escape. But when you found yourself in that condition, that's when you cried out to the one who could set you free, who could open up that cage and release you. And that's what he's speaking about when he says, Scripture has confined all under sin, 
that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. And so when you hear the gospel that says, I can set you free, I can forgive you, I love you, I will transform you, that sets you free. That's how it works. That's how it works. And he can take somebody who is bitter, he can take somebody who's angry, he can take somebody who's addicted, he can take somebody who's profane, he can take somebody who lives a promiscuous life, and he can transform that person into somebody who is like Jesus Christ because he sets you free. That's what Christianity is. It isn't rules and regulations. It's the love of God manifested by the grace of God in the face of Jesus Christ who loved you enough to die on a cross, take the curse from you upon himself and give you life. And that can only come through Jesus. It doesn't come through rules and regulations, it comes through grace. And that's why Paul is so upset at these people creeping in, bringing these, these Galatians into bondage because he's saying, it isn't the law that sets you free, it's the love of God and the grace of Jesus that does.